morning. morning. It's good to be here. Several weeks ago, Pastor Kurt called me, and he doesn't call me very often. Um, This is okay. And, uh, but when he calls, um, he said, uh, he said to me, uh, would you speak on Sunday, the September 3rd? And I go, that's Labor Day. Oh, man, I was counting on having the week off. (laughs) And, but something, you know that's something I'm talking about. The Holy Spirit went, oh, yes. And I said, yes, I will. And so I'm here. And, and then immediately after I hung up, I said, Lord, what are you doing? What is the message? What do you want me to talk about? And this scripture came to mind. It's in 1 Corinthians 2.6. It says uh, in verse 9, it says, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no one's heart has imagined all the things that God has prepared for those who love him. Isn't that a wonderful scripture? Now, I don't know about you, but I have a huge imagination. I can imagine a lot. And, and I've, got, I've got a spiritual bucket list that, that I've got out there that I believe it comes from the Lord. Because if you delight yourself in the Lord, he gives you the desire of your heart. He puts those desires in you. So... One of the interesting things about this scripture is if no eye has seen it and no ear has heard it, it's not recorded in here. Oh, then that makes me responsible to know what's in here. I've got to understand what's in here so that I can judge new things. And that's what he told me he wanted me to talk about. He wanted me to talk about new things. Now, communion is a new thing, but it's been around for 2,000 years. So it's getting a little older, a little more mature, but it's new to us every time we come and take it. I'm not really teaching on communion today, but I don't know, maybe I am. Um, New things. I think God's got some new things ahead for us, some major new things. So I always do this when I see something new in the body that I've never seen before or I see something new in the world, I've never seen it before, I follow the example of Jesus in Matthew 7 and I look for the fruit of it. What is the fruit of it? Not every new thing I've seen in church has been really satisfying to me. The enemy of new things is old things. We get comfortable with the old. And we get happy in our status quo. And then the Lord comes along. I have a friend as a senior pastor in Texas, and he likes to tell his congregation that his gifting is to comfort the afflicted and afflict the, uh, the comfortable. <laughs> pastor Randy, you are awesome. I hope you can meet him someday. And so when we're in our comfort zone, that's usually about when God is ready to disrupt it. He's going to bring some new thing. And the new things are the things that stimula, stimulate us to come up higher and come further into the Lord, further place of trust, whatever he is, what he's trying to do. The Holy Spirit is the one who produces the fruit we're looking for. We're looking for love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, humility, and self-control. Now, some other other tools the Lord gives us to judge new things, and I'll I'll mention that in a minute when I talk about prophecy. So I asked the Lord, I was seeking the Lord about the new things. Well, guess what? He didn't give me a list. Oh, I wish he would give me a list. (laughs) No, when he brings a new thing, it's going to be like he did when he himself was ministering. And I'll, I'll point something out like that in the morning, in a moment. But he, he showed me, he reminded me actually of something I'd forgotten. I'd been uh, taught on this years ago, that in, the, in your English Bible, when it says new in the New Testament, there are two Greek words behind that. And you, it's a good thing to understand which Greek word they used. So there's the word kainos. Yeah, there we go. Kainos, which means never before seen, new in form and quality, new as compared to the old. So the New Testament is kainos, leave that up for a moment, is kainos in the sense that it's never before seen, it's different in form and quality from the old. Do you see that? All right. But it wasn't new in time. The new covenant has existed from the beginning. And it was hidden from us. 
Because you see, it's the glory of God to conceal a matter and the glory of kings to seek it out. And so we are kings and priests unto him. He's got new things for us to seek. Neos, on the other hand, is new in time, recently begun and still proceeding. So the new covenant, interestingly enough, is both kainos and neos. It was new 2,000 years ago, but not in time. It was kainos. And the new covenant has been developing all along. This is an interesting thing to think about. Because this will help us understand when God is moving in our midst with new things. How many of you have noticed in the past several weeks, the Holy Spirit has just kind of snuck in during our praise and worship? Have you noticed that? And he's pulling that God card, which is, look at me. Put your trust in me. Put your hope in me. Trust me. And it's just, it's so exciting to, to see what's happening well, there was a kainos commandment that he gave. It was new in time, and it was never before seen, but not new in time, because the original commandment was to love your neighbor as yourself. And the first time I read that, I was a brand new believer in 1980, and I read that in the scripture, and I heard the voice of the Lord for the first time in my life, and I think, uh, first time I recognized it, I think he had spoken to me many times. But after I read that, he said, Bill, don't do that. And I was shaken by it. I said, what are you talking about? And he said, you don't love yourself. Don't love others that way. Oh, that really hurt. It took me years of exposure to him to get over myself. And I'm still not there. And some of you can say amen. <laughs> My wife would have speech. No. You heard her laugh, didn't you? Okay, but she's not mocking. I know that. Jesus gives a new commandment, qualitatively different. He said, I command you to love one another in the way I love you. In that way, you keep loving one another. Now, I found that really interesting. I've heard that commandment before, and I want to walk in it. Amen? Yeah, I think we all do. Are we doing it? Uh, I don't know. Um, in Galatians 6, 15, it says, For neither being circumcised nor being uncircumcised matters. What matters is being a new kainos creation. So substantially, sub, uh, qualitatively different, but not necessarily new in time. And that's what happens when you get born again. What happens when you are a new creature in Christ, when you accept Jesus as your Lord, you acknowledge that Jesus is the Messiah, and you pray, and he comes in and changes you on the inside, and you become a new creature, a new creation. And Paul, and it continues to say there, and as many of you who order your lives according to this information, or according to this rule, shalom on you. Now, I use the, the Jewish word because the English word peace just doesn't carry the impact. Peace is the absence of conflict. But shalom is wholeness, fullness, fullness of health, all parts present, nothing broken, nothing missing. That's shalom. Jesus is the prince of shalom. He comes to impart shalom to us. And mercy upon them. Mercy cancels judgment. This is substantially different from the old covenant. If you sinned in the old covenant and broke the law, what happened? <coughs> or stoning or something else. <laughs> there was punishment. But in the new covenant, if you sin or when you sin, you confess it and he is faithful and just to cleanse you forgive you, and wipe away the debt you owed. Amen. How many of you have been guilty? Don't raise your hands. I know you're guilty. <laughs> we were guilty raising our kids. There are consequences to what you do, kids. If you guys have heard that, it's time to hear something new. In the kingdom of God, 
Jesus wipes away the consequences if you'll follow him, if you trust him, if you don't give up and keep going. Never give up. I encourage you to never give up. Age has nothing to do with this. Even if you mess up at this great old age, some of you say, how old are you, Pastor Bill? Well, I would say there's only a handful of you in this room who are older. So that's telling you something. This ought to tell you something. <laughs> Never give up because the blood of Jesus covers our sin and wipes away the debt that we owe. Amen? So I think that's what it means to be a new creation. When, when I was born again on Easter Sunday in April 1980, I had no idea what happened. I walked into the church that morning full of fear because my first wife was pregnant and she had a brain tumor, and those are not two things that you want your wife to have. We were looking forward to that baby, but we didn't know what was going to happen with that brain tumor. I had known about Jesus most of my life. I had heard about him. I believed he was the Son of God, but I had never surrendered to him until that morning. When I walked out of the church, the fear was gone, the sky was blue, I could hear the birds chirping, just like the Word of God says, everything was new. But one thing that wasn't new was this body. I still had the same body, (laughs) and I still had the same soul, but I had a brand new spirit in me. That's what changed me and has continued to change me over the years, even to this day, is still changing me. Glory to God. So I said, Jesus, what makes us different? What really makes us different? And he took me to that kainos commandment, that new commandment. John 13, he says, I am giving you a new commandment that you keep on loving each other the same way I have loved you. You also love each other and keep on loving each other. Everyone will know, everyone will know that you are my Talmudim, my disciples, by the way that you love each other. Wow. A lot of times, and this might sting to hurt, I think people know that we're church people by the way we treat each other but they don't necessarily know that we're followers of Christ. Amen? Well, don't get heavy about that. Don't get put down. Just confess it and say, Lord, I have not loved my neighbors in the way that you love us. Thank you for forgiving me and cleansing me of that unrighteousness. Now take me up higher. I want to come up higher. I want to get into what this is all about and understand it and see it. I was thinking about these new things, and we're going to have a new building. We all know that. You know, give me a minute to put on my Captain Obvious hat, okay? We all know a new building's coming. One of these days, Pastor Kurt's going to get up and say, the building's ready to start services in. Oh, by the way, we're going to go back to one service. That's going to be a new thing. Get ready for that. Hallelujah. All the volunteers shout amen. We don't know how long it's going to last, but anyway, we will be <laughs> back to one service. And because the Spirit of God is already preparing us by moving among us, I don't think he's going to quit. I think he's going to step it up, okay? And I think that there are personal changes coming for each one of us. That's called transformation. And there are changes coming for the congregation. And this big change that he's got in place for us is developing his kind of love in us. I believe that's coming. A couple of you are excited about it. (laughs) Now, how did I know that this is what God wanted me to, to talk about? I was sitting on the patio. It was August 8th. I still had a month away to prepare my message, but I'm the kind of guy, I need to have my message prepared weeks in advance because I rehearse it and practice it and go over it and over it and try to get all the mistakes out and try to get all the rabbit trails out of the way, like the one I'm on. And, uh, <laughs> and I was sitting on the patio drinking my, I think I was having tea that morning. No, he said you're having coffee. So I was having coffee, and I noticed the date, and it said 8 8 23. 
Now, I'm not teaching you to become numerologists, but just be aware that numbers have meanings. If you see a number over and over, and you just, you can't, why am I seeing the number eight? Why am I seeing two eights? Why am I seeing four, four, four? I was at a a teaching by uh, uh, Bob Hazlett a couple years ago, and he had been seeing four, 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 and he was asking the Lord, Lord, why am I seeing four, four, four? He's driving behind someone, the license plate says four, four, four. Looks at his watch, and it's a digital watch, four, four, four. What am I seeing four, four, four? And he taught us that 444 is the, is the number of fullness, the fullness of time. And then God led him into the message that was full and ready to be released at that time. So I'm sitting there, 8, 8, 23. 8 is the number of new beginnings. Two eights, it's doubled. And that means the new beginnings he has ahead for us are going to have many new beginnings, many increases, many new levels that he'll be taking us to. And when you add 8 plus 8, you get 16. And the number 16 points to the 16 aspects or traits of unconditional love. This love Jesus said we're supposed to have for each other, the love he has for us. So we need to take a look at this and understand when we look at 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter, it's sandwiched between 1 Corinthians 12 and 14 where Paul teaches about flowing with the Holy Spirit. You you can go back and look at that and, and study that. We'll probably get some teaching in the days ahead on that. But the Holy Spirit produces this love. And it's important for us to look at it. In the first couple of verses of this chapter, Jesus, it says in the Word of God that though you speak in tongues and you got faith and you move mountains and you do all these things, if you don't have this unconditional love, what you're doing is worthless. Oops. Come on. Come on. So I want to look at these 16 traits of love And be aware that God is love, so you could read it this way. And and if it's up there, is that up there on the screen? Yeah, there we go. The aspects of love. Skip, go to the next one. Oh, no, no, stay right there. Go back. Sorry. Okay. You could say in verse 4 there, it says love is patient. You could say God is patient, long-suffering, long-spirited. Yeah, his spirit is really long. He reaches around the world. And he's, and he's patiently enduring. He's kind, shows himself useful, acting benevolently. He's not jealous, which means envious. He's not boastful, bragging, boastful, vaunting himself. Go to the next one. And uh, he's not proud, and that word means to blow. Like to blow up a balloon, or to be a blowhard, or to get all puffed up, proud and haughty. God is not rude doesn't behave himself uncomely or unseemly. He's not selfish, not self-interested. Putting himself ahead of others is what he does. He's not easily angered. I put easily in brackets because it's not in the original manuscript. It literally says he's not angered. And the word there is to be provoked or to be stirred. And I was thinking of an analogy of this one, and that is what, how many of you still watch the news? Some of you are going like this. Yeah, be careful, because I'll tell you what, the news will cause you to react. And if you don't react with the love of God, you might get stirred up and angry, and you don't want to do that. Boy, that thing needs to be dealt with. (laughs) Either that or I need a pick up my feet and step over it. If I fall down, it's not the Spirit of God. It's because I tripped. (laughs) New things are coming our way. Amen? And let's keep going through the rest of these uh, elements of uh, of what it means. Um, This is really important. Point number nine, love keeps no record of wrongs. It means to take an inventory of ill, evil, wrong, injurious, and wicked things and hang on to it. I want to say this to you. I got a revelation of this some time ago. In heaven, there is no record of your wrongs. 
if you are in Christ. If you are not in Christ, get there. Come to faith in him. Activate that faith by saying, I believe in my heart Jesus is Lord, and I believe my sins are dealt with. That's how you get into the kingdom. That's how you get your record of wrongs erased. But when we believers come before Jesus and stand before his judgment seat, you're not going to hear him talk to you about your sin and your failures. He's going to say, what did you do with the kingdom I gave you? What did you do with the word I gave you? What, would you do? what did you do with the spirit I gave you? What about the gifts I gave you? Do you know the gifts he's given you? I'm looking right at you, man. Do you know the gifts he's given you? What it, what's one of them? Put you on the spot, didn't I? What is it? Faith. That was the one that was coming up from, with me, too. Faith. Wow. He's given everybody the measure of faith, hasn't he? Every one of us has that measure. It's our job to step out in trust and keep our hope in him and walk out that faith. Amen? And the only way we can do it is with this love, this love that cancels debts, this love that says, I want no record of wrongs. If you've got a record of wrongs and you got something that was done to you years ago or maybe it was something you did and you can't get rid of it, I would urge you in this church to get either a soaking prayer appointment or come get a sozo in my ministry. It, either way, you'll have an opportunity to get into the presence of the one who wipes away the debt. And that's what you need to experience. So, whoops. Let's keep going here. Love does not gloat over other people's sins. Oh, my gosh. How many times, Lord, have I said, yep, they're getting what they deserve? <laughs> I'm not going to say that anymore. What I'm going to say instead is what Jesus said on the cross. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Father, have mercy on them and cancel the consequences that are going to hit them if they don't repent. Love always, I love this, love bears up. It means to cover over with silence, to bear up under, to suffer without retaliation. Do you know when Jesus was on the cross, he could have called on legions of angels to take him off the cross and wipe out every human on the planet. And he didn't, because he loves us in this way. Wow. He also told a thief on the cross with him, you'll be with me in paradise today. Yeah, even though you haven't been baptized and you haven't been to the discipleship class and you... What an amazing thing. Love always trusts the 13th aspect of it. Who does God trust? Well, he is trust, and he trusts himself. He has no reason not to trust himself. He's worthy of trust. And what we trust in is we trust our well-being in Christ in every situation. That's how we trust. When, when you read love always trusts, it doesn't mean I trust the government. I always trust uh, what the president says. I... Lord, I bless him, and I ask you to bless him, and I ask you to show him who you are. Show him who you are before it's too late. Love always hopes. <clears throat> what does God have to hope about? He is hope. Hope is a constant expectation of a positive outcome, and God never has any expectation of failure. He always knows the outcome will be good. Amen? So we take that hope. We keep our hope in Christ, keep our hope in God, because hope deferred makes the heart sick. If you stop hoping in God, you get heart sick. All right? And so if you're heart sick, hey, get your hope back in God. Start trusting in the Lord. 
Trusting in the Lord no matter what, hoping in him for that positive outcome. Love always doers and th- endures. And th- this is interesting because it means to remain under. I am older in years and experience and a whole bunch of other things than Pastor Kurt. But I put myself under him to lead me and I follow him as I see him following Christ. Now, I don't understand so much in God, but God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit are all submitted to one another. I don't understand that. If you can figure out the Trinity, would you write a book so we can all enjoy it? So this, this example of remaining under for us as believers is that we put ourselves under the authority of Christ. And hear this, it means to bear with patience trials and persecution as Jesus did and does. So in the days ahead, I want to bear any trial, any persecution, anything comes our way, I want to do it the way Jesus did. Amen? But Lord, if you can avoid, keep the trials away, keep the persecution at bay, please do it. I love this one, though. God never ends. Love never ends. What it means is it never falls down. It never fails. And that last word, light on, it just struck me in this book I was reading with the detail of this. So what does that mean? Well, you know the uh, whatever motel it was will keep the light on for you? Well, we're going to do that. As the world gets darker, we're going to keep the light on. Amen? We're going to keep loving. In fact, we're going to love more than we've ever loved before. Because this is something God is doing with us. He's taking us higher up and deeper into his love. And in verse 14, or chapter 14, verse 1, this is so Jewish. It says, pursue love. But keep eagerly seeking the gifts or the things of the Spirit especially seek to be able to prophesy. And that one, we measure prophecy by edification, exhortation, and comfort. It, does it edify me? Does it exhort me? Is it comforting me? If it's not, then I have to be careful. It may not be a prophetic word from the Lord. But pursue love. I believe that in the days ahead, God is going to take us up into a new way of pursuing love, of pursuing him. And he's the one, the Holy Spirit is the one who is going to develop that love in us. It's not up to you to do it. Whatever you do, don't try to be an unconditional lover. Just don't do that. Let him build that in you. Okay, I'm talking to the youth especially because you older ones, you know what I mean. They're not there yet. They're going to be coming along in this uh, this journey. And we need to walk in a way that... uh, demonstrates that love to the world. So the world sees who we are and who Jesus is. So I'm not teaching you to look for new things or to pursue new things. God's already got those prepared for us. He'll bring them about at the right time. What I am encouraging you to do is to get into your word and to get into the spirit I love the example Pastor Kurt gave when, uh, it just, just when he was doing the introduction here today and he was talking about the, the Lord showing him something or, or me seeing that date, and I immediately turned to the Lord and said, Lord, what does this mean? What are you showing me? What is this about? I want to leave this with you. I want to, leave, I want to place a seed for Pastor Kurt to think about, okay, for him to ponder I've had a desire in my heart to be a part of a particular church. And there are seven churches or ecclesias that Jesus speaks to in Revelation. And there's one in particular, the Church of Philadelphia. Now, Philadelphia means brotherly love. And I've seen a lot of brotherly love, and I think that's good. But I want to see unconditional love. I want to see the way the Lord loves and in, in me and, and flow in that love. And here is the, in Revelation 3, 7, Jesus speaks to the messianic community, the ecclesia in Philadelphia, right? Here is the message of, of HaKadosh, the Holy One. 
the true one, the one who has the key of David, who if he opens something, no one else can shut it. If he closes something, no one else can open it. I know what you're doing. Look, I have put in front of you an open door, and no one can shut it. I believe we have an open door before us, City Lights. I know that you have but a little power. Don't worry about that. A little power is not bad. God's not going to fall off his throne. Oh, Jesus, look how weak they are. No. He says, Jesus, you need to be strong. They don't have strength yet. So guess what? When we're weak, he's strong. Amen? So, you have obeyed my message. You've not disavowed me, which means contradict, disavow, abnegate, reject, renounce, or refuse. Never want to do that, Lord. Here, I will give you, here, now, I will give you some of the synagogue of the adversary, the accuser, those who call themselves Jews, but they're not. On the contrary, they are lying. I will cause them to come and prostrate themselves at your feet, and they will know that I have loved you. Oh, my gosh. In the days ahead, who would think of Jews coming into our congregation to be born again? Shocking. Because you did obey my message about persevering, I will keep you from the time of trial coming upon the whole world to put the people living on earth to the, to the test. That's the promise I'm holding on to. That's what's motivating me to love like Jesus loves. But also it's the Spirit of God motivating me because that's what he wants to do. He says in verse 11, he says, I'm coming soon. I believe that, Lord. I believe you're coming back soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one can take away your crown. And I will make him who wins the victory a pillar in the temple of my God, and he will never leave it. I will also write on him the name of my God and the name of my God's city, the new Yerushalayim, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from my God and my own new name. And those who have ears, let them hear what the Spirit is saying to the Messianic communities. He did not make that promise to any of the other ecclesias, only to this one, the ecclesia in Philadelphia. It was called the Church of Love, okay? All right. Well, remember the date was 8-8-23. What about 23? The Lord took me to this. I love my new uh, complete Jewish Bible. It's a little bit tough to use because the Old Testament is arranged in the Jewish order, not the Gentile order. So we all know where, where the Psalms are in, in our Gentile Bibles. But in the, in the Jewish Bible, it comes in a different place. It takes some getting used to. And I'm flipping over and looking at that contents all the time. Listen to this, though, from a Jewish perspective. Adonai, the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He has me lie down in grassy pastures. He leads me by quiet water. He restores my inner being. He guides me in right paths for the sake of his own name. Even if I pass through death-dark ravines, I will fear no disaster, for you, Adonai, are with me. Your rod and your staff reassure me. You prepare a table for me, even as my enemies watch you. You anoint my head with oil from an overflowing cup. Goodness and grace will pursue me every day of my life, and I will live in the house of Adonai for years and years to come. I especially like that last one because at my great old age, I don't know how many more years I have, but years and years sounds good to me. I've got grandchildren. I want to see them grow up at least more than they are now. I believe he's prepared a table for us in the midst of our enemies. And uh, I want the uh, ushers to prepare. They're going to lead you here in a minute. And I want the uh, whoever needs to take this table back down and put the elements back on it to come take care of that. In light of what we've heard, that the Spirit of God 
has to live in us to be a new creation. That he also has to feed us. And Jesus said that he is the bread that comes down from heaven. The manna that they ate in the Old Testament, they ate and they died. But if you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you'll never die. That's what's kainos about this new covenant, among many, many, many other things. But right now, this is just bread, and it's just wine or grape juice. We offer both here in this service. You'll come forward, and the uh, server will hand you a piece of bread, and then you will dip it in the wine or the grape juice, whichever you prefer. Just let them know. And all you have to do is just say wine or grape juice or whatever. Otherwise, they're going to hand you the, the cup with the wine, except children. We give children grape juice. Most of you probably are going to get grape juice. But here's what you do when you come take this. You recognize that after we pray, this changes. It's no longer bread. It's no longer wine or grape juice. It's what Jesus said it was. And he said, unless you eat this bread and drink this, wine, you won't have life. So what happens when I take in the body of Jesus and the, and the blood of Jesus, what happens? In the natural, I don't know if you know this, but if you've ever had a, a transfusion of blood, I had many several years ago when I had an operation. But when you have a transfusion of blood, you get some of the DNA of the donor. That's in the natural. What about in the spiritual that reflects the natural? God has created it all. I'm coming for a transfusion. I need the DNA of Jesus in me to love like he loves, to live like he lives, to have the eternal perspective that he has. I need this body and blood. And you know, at, in, in most churches, we read Psalm 23 at a funeral and there's nothing wrong with that it does comfort us but this is a celebratory song the Lord is my shepherd I don't I lack nothing he's with me he has set a table for me in the midst of all of those the, the, the voices of the enemy who accuse me constantly and say well you failed you did this you did that but I'm not keeping that record of wrongs and neither is he. He loves me. He wants you to know how much he loves you because he gave himself for you. And as you come and receive this, what are you expecting? I'm gonna pray, if I get my notes back out, without spilling my water. I want you to hear this. I learned from my Jewish friend, Rabbi uh, Haim Urbach, who went to be with Jesus in March. And I got to hang out with him for about five years. And I learned that there's a difference between praying and speaking a blessing. And I'm not praying, asking God to do something. I'm speaking what he's doing. Does that make sense? So listen to this. Holy Father, our Savior, King of the universe, the one who lives in all who put their trust in Jesus the Messiah, the one who gives us life, the one who is at work developing in us all the aspects of the nature of Jesus and the love that he is abundantly overflowing in our lives. In the name above all names, Jesus of Nazareth, we trust you, Holy Father, to now bless this bread and this wine and this grape juice for our benefit. May all sickness, disease, weakness, doubt, any thoughts contrary to your holy word be removed from us now as we consume this heavenly holy food that you provide us. In the name of Jesus, I trust you, Father. I trust you to do it. 
When you come forward, the ushers will release you row by row. Uh, servers, if you'd come up now. Again, they're going to hand you a piece of bread. There is uh, gluten-free bread available if you need that. And then they will offer you the cup. But come with an expectation. Come with a desire to be fed the very life and nature of Jesus. That you walk away with strength. And by the way, this is not a funeral. Some of you can notify your face that life in the kingdom is righteousness, peace, and joy. And one third of the kingdom is joy. So let's joyfully receive the body and blood of Jesus. Amen? God bless you. I love you.